give a round of applause to our sponsors. Thank you for making uh, these meetings free. Usually pass around a donation plate. Uh, unfortunately, we're not doing that today. But um, thank you to uh, David Rankin for finding our speaker today. Our speaker is going to speak about, uh, as you can see, the basics of wallets and wallet security. Um, and then after that, we have a special announcement uh, from Graham that uh, I believe is putting on a special event. So we want to stick around for that. Uh, he'll talk to everybody after that. But um, uh, general disclosure, general disclosure, huh? yeah, um, general disclosure, Josh is going to be recording his presentation, oh, yeah. just so everybody knows and is familiar with that. Um, realize if you do talk or you might be in the video that's being recorded on the screen, just so that way you're aware. Um, so everybody knows. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, but uh, without further ado, um, I don't know the uh, speaker that well, but uh, let's all give it, uh, let's all give a round of applause for Josh. <laughs> Unmute and give him a round of applause and uh, take it away, Josh. Well, uh, I want to say thanks a bunch to everyone for being here virtually. Uh, it's, it's really exciting to still be able to do this kind of thing, uh, you know, even though we can't meet physically. It's a, it's a great uh, bit of technology, uh, just like Bitcoin. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is just a little bit of the basics of wallets and wallet security. So this is um, a newer version of a, a similar talk I gave at our local Pittsburgh meetup. Um, you know, I try to give unique talks every time I speak. Um, so I added some new information to this, but just want to help people understand technically what's going on when you actually have a Bitcoin wallet and uh, understand just some basic premises when it comes to security and the trade-offs of different types of wallets. So just a little bit about me since, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from uh, the other side of the U.S. I'm, uh, you know, uh, Pittsburgh-based, obviously, and haven't met any of you yet. Uh, I'm a software engineer uh, at Microsoft in Pittsburgh. So uh, my full-time job is to write code for a part of Azure Storage. Uh, but I have a real passion as a computer scientist and developer for uh, cryptocurrency technology and, and really explaining that technology, learning it, teaching it, uh, helping people understand how it actually works and some of the use cases that they might be able to apply to their own situation. So I have a YouTube channel. It's Chain to UTS. I have a website with blog posts and uh, you know, I'm on a couple different social media sites. You can connect with me to, to uh, We'll see what I'm putting out there. So a quick disclaimer from me, you know, I'm a software engineer and I'm somebody that likes to focus on security and, you know, secure development practices, but I'm not by any means a security expert. So, you know, security in general with uh, technology is something that's a complex and evolving topic. There, there's no one size fits all solution to everybody's security practices. You have to kind of understand your threat model, understand what you want to do with your technology, and uh, just learn about the tools that you can use. So we're going to talk in a, in a like kind of a broad intermediate level sense about some Bitcoin fundamentals and some security tools and security practices you should be aware of. So what exactly is a Bitcoin wallet? And, and I understand Brian and David were saying this is maybe a little bit more of an intermediate level group. So some of this might be review for a lot of you. But what a Bitcoin wallet really is, is something that people often misunderstand in the space. They say, does a wallet have my coins in it? Well, what a wallet really is fundamentally is a collection of private cryptographic keys. So your private keys that are generated securely by your wallets are used to derive your public keys and your addresses that you use for receiving uh, rather than you know, storing any kind of actual coin information or anything like that. That's not a concept that really exists in a Bitcoin wallet. Private keys used to be just completely randomly generated. Uh, so that was, it, it, uh, in the early days, if you had a Bitcoin wallet, every 100 transactions or so that you would do, you would actually have to redo a new backup of your wallet. But nowadays, they are all generated from a single uh, cryptographic seed, and that's stored in a seed phrase, which most of you are probably familiar with. It's a 12 to 24 word uh, English phrase that you can write down. It's a lot easier to backup and remember. 
So again, we start out with a private key. So I have this little hex encoded uh, example private key here. This isn't a real key for anything. Uh, we start out with a private key in, in Bitcoin and most major cryptocurrencies. This is a 256 bit key. So that key is then run through an elliptic curve algorithm. So this is a public private key algorithm to get your public key. But the public key in Bitcoin is not actually what you use as your receiving address. There's a couple other encoding steps that happen uh, along the way. So you go from your public key and you actually do a double hash of that. You run it through SHA-256 and RIPE-MD-160 and then you encode it in a special format, which for Bitcoin legacy addresses at least is base 58 check encoding. And that gives you what you finally see as your public receiving address. So when you wanna get Bitcoin from somebody or you wanna get another cryptocurrency from somebody, you give them this public, uh, this public key hash. And this is something that is something that you can share with anyone. One of the things I, I love to talk about when I talk to business groups and that sort of thing is the idea of how much more inherently secure this type of system is for sending and receiving than something like a debit or a credit card. Because you all know if you go to Target or you go to any other store and you give them your debit card or your credit card, what you're really doing is exchanging private information and you're hoping and trusting uh, that Target or whatever receiving party that you're dealing with doesn't run off and withdraw more from your accounts or worse yet, lose your information, which has happened in many of these data breaches that we've seen. With this cryptocurrency system from an end user perspective, it's a lot more secure because uh, you never have to exchange any private information ever. You're only doing digital signatures and uh, the merchant is only giving you a public, uh, public bit, the public of information that you send to with their address. So this is another interesting uh, modern innovation in the Bitcoin space since the early days. And that's this idea of using a mnemonic seed uh, that's an encoded seed phrase that you can use to always derive a bunch of public or a bunch of private keys and therefore uh, public keys and addresses in a deterministic fashion. So you get this seed phrase and if you write that down and back that up and that's for your mobile phone wallet and you drop your phone in the toilet, you don't lose all your Bitcoin. That's, that's a really great innovation. And this also makes backups much, much easier to deal with because it used to be you would have essentially a dot dot data file uh, full of private keys that you would have to back up as you did more and more transactions in your wallet. But with this, you only have to deal with 12 to 24 words. It's a lot less error prone than dealing with uh, other encoded forms of private keys like hexadecimal or uh, the WIF, the wallet import format that is popular with paper wallets. So this just makes life a lot easier. And this all works by starting with one single cryptographic seed. Uh, that seed is anywhere from 128 to 256 bits. So the 120, uh, the 128 bit cryptographic seed gives you 12 words, and then it can be a couple different sizes up to 24 words, which is a the 256 bit seed. And then there's an algorithm that you that's used, and I'm not intimately familiar with the details of that yet as, as I'm learning this, that allows you to generate this tree of uh, child and grandchild and many generations of keys. So you start out with this one seed, you get two uh, childs, you get multiple grandchildren, and anytime that you need to restore your wallet, uh, you're able to get the same set of private keys. So again, this is a process that's deterministic. And so that means that if you take this seed phrase from one wallet and import it into another wallet, you're always gonna get the same um, private keys back and the same addresses back. But there's one little caveat with that I'm gonna talk about next. So different wallets do use what are called different derivation paths to generate your keys. So it's this kind of interesting little uh, looking phrase here, this M44 prime, zero prime, zero prime, zero, zero. 
Uh, this is a, an example wallet that you might use for Bitcoin. The M slash 44 is constant. And I was doing a little bit more reading about this uh, with Andreas Antonopoulos' books that I use as a, as a learning resource a lot. Uh, this has something to do with the, um, I think the first level of child that you're using, but I don't wanna speak too much on that. Um, the zero prime is the, the first zero prime, I should say, is the coin. So the great thing about the BIP44 standard, uh, BIP44 is an enhancement on BIP32, the Bitcoin improvement proposal, which originally proposed these um, HD hierarchical deterministic wallets. BIP44 brings on a couple different rules uh, that allow you to do things like multiple coins. So for example, uh, the first zero prime here that you're seeing in this derivation path indicates Bitcoin as the coin. Uh, but there are different ones, like I believe two prime is Litecoin, um, and there's many others. Uh, I, uh, I know 125 prime is uh, Bitcoin cash addresses. So if you're doing Bitcoin cash cash adder, that's 125. Uh, there's a different derivation path for BETCH32 SegWit Bitcoin addresses. So this allows you to have multiple coins actually come from the same seed phrase. So for example, you know, I'm a big fan of mobile phone wallets for day-to-day -day spending. Um, you know, I'm kind of a, you know, Bitcoin as cash person. And so uh, there's a couple different mobile phone wallets I use that are multi-asset. They give me one seed phrase and I can have support from that same seed phrase for Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Litecoin, Digibyte, a bunch of different assets that I might want to try out and use. And that's part of this BIP44 standard here. So the second zero prime that you're seeing here is the first account. Another great thing that this standard allows you to do is have multiple accounts under the same seed phrase. So for example, you could have a personal spending uh, Bitcoin account. You could have a savings account for yourself under that same seed phrase. Although I think in most cases you might want to do that offline with a hardware wallet. You, you could do it this way. Um, and an example that I use is I can uh, also have a business account. So for example, for myself, I have a personal spend account and I have a chain toots uh, account that I can use to receive payment when I do private tutoring or uh, receive tips online all from the same seed phrase backup, but it allows me to separate those out as if I had two different bank accounts uh, in my mobile phone wallet. Now, the last two zeros there are uh, also kind of an interesting um, part of the BIP44 standard. So the first zero means uh, that th this address that you're deriving here is an external address. Wallets that use this standard will make a distinction between addresses that they generate to give you as public receiving addresses. So as your wallet generates new addresses for you to actually receive Bitcoin on. And then if this is a one, this indicates that this is a change address. So those derived addresses are only used internally in your wallet to receive change when you do a transaction. And then that last zero just indicates whether or not that's the first receiving address or the second receiving address or the third change address and that sort of thing. So this is, I think, an interesting standard. It's a little bit confusing when you first look at these uh, derivation paths and that sort of thing, but I've run into that a lot, especially when I try to help people with recoveries. Um, so two of my more popular tutorial videos explain uh, what happens if you accidentally send uh, Bitcoin cash to a Bitcoin, a Bitcoin legacy address. That's, that's unfortunately a common thing that happens because they share uh, a legacy address format. And so sometimes the wallet's uh, derivation paths come into play. Like you might've sent off to a uh, Bitcoin address wallet that your hardware wallet displayed and your Bitcoin cash is actually in there, but you need to uh, recover that with another wallet using the, pro the appropriate derivation path and then send it to an address that your hardware wallet actually recognizes to receive that. So what about my addresses, my transactions, my balances, all of that information that's actually useful to me? Well, that's not stuff that's actually stored in the wallet software. That's really information that's stored on the public blockchain. So your balance for your wallet is actually information that's stored on the public Bitcoin blockchain. It's not really something that the wallet stores. The wallet simply 
generates addresses um, using this deterministic process from your seed phrase and, and your private keys. And then it goes out and fetches the balance data and that sort of thing that it needs off of the blockchain. So for full node Bitcoin wallets, wallets that actually download the entire blockchain, they get that information directly from the blockchain that's stored on that node. Um, but for many wallets like mobile light client wallets that you might use on your phone, they might go out to a public API for that company. So for example, if you use the Bitcoin.com or Konami mobile wallets, those are ones that I like, uh, they have you know, their own API endpoints that they run to fetch information. Um, and they also use a special protocol that's built into Bitcoin called SPV or Simplified Payment Verification that allows them to directly fetch that information from other Bitcoin node peers on the network. So it just depends on how the wallet is set up. There's a couple different ways that can happen. So what's the number one rule of Bitcoin, right? This, is, this was a term coined by Andreas Antonopoulos, and I think it's so important uh, to you know, repeat this and kind of shout it to the heavens. Not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Uh, there are different types of wallets out there. We're gonna talk about the difference between custodial and non-custodial wallets next. But it's really important to remember this point. Anyone that has access to the private keys in your Bitcoin wallet has access to your funds. The private key is what ultimately determines ownership of the Bitcoin. So what's rule number two? Not your keys, not your Bitcoin. It's really that important and it's worth saying again. Whoever controls the private keys controls the funds that are locked in that Bitcoin address. So let's talk about some of the different types of wallets and some of the pros and cons for each. There are really uh, what I break down as three categories of wallets. There are custodial wallets, there are online wallets, which have a couple different subtypes, and there's offline wallets. So the first type of wallet, I think it's the type of wallet that most newcomers are exposed to first because uh, these wallets also generally come with the service of allowing you to uh, get cryptocurrency that you want. So these are generally exchange wallets. Think of Coinbase, Binance, Gemini, etc. These are usually cryptocurrency exchanges. And what these services do is they don't give you a seed phrase and they don't give you direct access to your private keys. They hold that information in trust for you. So they are really acting more like a traditional bank account. They are holding in trust under your name some cryptocurrency assets, but they ultimately have control over the funds because they have the private keys. So at the end of the day, when those funds need to be unlocked for spending to create a new transaction on the blockchain, uh, that is done by the exchange on your behalf. It's not really done by you on the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin network. So I think especially for those of us that are you know, crypto enthusiasts that understand this space well, or at least understand it at an above beginner level, uh, we often kind of decry using custodial wallets because of that number one rule, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. But there is a real use case and a real pro for custodial wallets, and that is simply ease of use and ease of security. If you're new to the space and you don't understand this stuff well, if you're somebody that's maybe not super tech savvy in the first place, like you know maybe an older person in your life that uh, doesn't use computers much, uh, it gives them a way to on-ramp to cryptocurrency that doesn't require them to understand all of these security uh, protocols and pitfalls that you get when you hold your own funds. So I do think that they are useful in the case of, I don't really understand this, but I wanna dabble in Bitcoin, I wanna dabble in Ethereum. Uh, you know, Companies like Coinbase do have a pretty solid reputation uh, for security and have insurance and things like that. So you know, for certain amounts or for an introductory wallet, uh, I think that that's okay. Again, it just depends on the use case. Now, the obvious con of that is you're falling back on a traditional banking model. One of the great things that I think really the ultimate innovation of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is the fact that you truly hold your own money 
in a digital space, right? Owning Bitcoin where you have a wallet where you control the private keys is just like having a hundred dollar bill in your hand. It really is digital cash that you control. And that's so, that's so innovative compared to what we've had in terms of a digital economy uh, since the inception of the digital economy, right? Credit cards, PayPal accounts, uh, online banking access is all done through custodial trust. But with Bitcoin, you get to hold your own money. And we have seen uh, this centralized banking model applied to Bitcoin fail catastrophically in uh, instances. So uh, with MT Gox, with more recently with Quadriga CX, we saw exchanges go under and people's funds simply disappear, never to be recovered, uh, because those users didn't truly hold the, the private keys. And those institutions became a, excuse me, those institutions became a central target and a central point of failure. So let's move on to uh, non-custodial online wallets. So for example, this is um, a Bitcoin Core full node client that you run. Maybe you have a Raspberry Pi or you have a, an old desktop computer and you want to actually run your own Bitcoin or Litecoin full node. That's an online uh, non-custodial wallet. Or maybe using, you're using an SPV uh, you know, or API backed uh, mobile wallet like the Bitcoin.com wallets or Coinomi multi-asset wallets. So this is a wallet where the private keys are generated and stored on an online device. You control the private keys in this case. So you have a, a seed phrase, a cryptographic seed or private keys that are generated and you actually really own the funds that you're sending to that wallet. So the major pros of this are these wallets are generally still pretty easy to use. Um, the communities put a lot of effort into the user experience for these mobile wallets and that sort of thing. And you know, it's still fairly easy to onboard to that wallet if you're a reasonably tech savvy person. Uh, they're great for everyday transactions. Uh, you know, smaller amounts where, you know, if there is some kind of underlying vulnerability, uh, you might be okay if you lose some of that money and it gives you quick access to funds. So if you're somebody that likes to, you know, spend your cryptocurrency, tip people online, buy goods and services, uh, it's really easy to just open up your mobile phone or open up your full node wallet on your PC and create new transactions to send funds. Now, one of the cons of this is uh, if you are online all the time with this device, you're on a Windows PC, you're on a Linux PC, you're on an Android mobile device, there's simply more attack vectors, right? There's always the chance of malware infecting that system, uh, something that gets a hold of your private keys and is able to phone home somewhere else and allow attackers to steal your funds. So the final type of wallet that I like to talk about is the offline wallet. So most popularly, we're talking about hardware wallets. We're talking about the Keep Key, the Ledger, um, more traditionally and, and fallen out of favor for certain reasons, things like paper wallets or um, Kasaskis coins uh, that used to exist, like actually taking a, a key pair and engraving it in metal or printing it on paper or engraving it in a coin, uh, that kind of thing. You control the private keys and these keys are generated and stored on offline devices. So your key key or, or your ledger, for example, your funds or, or your private keys rather are generated totally offline and they're stored totally offline. You only access these, you only access an internet connection when you go to create a transaction. And a great pro of these hardware wallets is when you actually plug in a ledger or something like that to make a transaction, it's not a general purpose USB device. There's a very specialized limited protocol that uh, the computer communicates with the device to create the signature and receive the transaction data to broadcast to the network, uh, but doesn't allow something like fetching uh, the private keys off of the device. The obvious pros of this is we're talking about the highest level of security. So these are devices where if you're using them correctly uh, and they're designed correctly, it becomes very, very, very difficult to find any attack vector where someone could steal your private keys and therefore steal your funds.
Uh, you know, if you send money to an address that you generated off a hardware wallet, you keep that hardware wallet in the seed phrase somewhere safe, uh, you're generally not going to lose funds that way. So it's really great for long-term storage and higher amount storage. Uh, because again, you know, if you're using something like a mobile phone, I wouldn't want to keep my whole crypto net worth on this mobile phone. I would want to keep some amount for day-to-day -day spending, just like I would a checking account, and then keep uh, maybe a more long-term savings in an offline type of wallet. Now, the cons of this is it's a little bit more complicated to deal with. Um, hardware wallets are less so. They're, they have a pretty good user experience these days, and a hardware wallet is really, really the recommended way to go uh, for newcomers that want to uh, securely store larger amounts of funds that maybe they're considering an investment or a long-term savings. Um, dealing with just key pairs, so dealing with like the paper wallet style, uh, it's a bit more complicated and it's actually quite easy to screw up and uh, lose money that way. So the you know paper wallets have kind of fallen out of favor. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for that. I mean, if you are properly, securely, generating a private key uh, and you know what you're doing, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I, I actually have a little side project that I did where I used a uh, microcontroller with a built-in cryptographic random number generator and made my own offline key pair generator. So it um, you know, uses the CRNG, it runs through all the cryptography to generate the, the key pair, so the, the private key and address, and then writes it on a little display or prints it out on a receipt paper or something like that so I can engrave it uh, in metal and you know keep it somewhere safe. Uh, but I was coming at coming at that as an engineer and understanding the pitfalls. And there are pitfalls like change addresses, for example. A lot of people make the mistake of trying to spend just a little bit of money they have stored in a paper wallet address and find that their change went into whatever wallet they uh, imported that private key into and not back to the paper wallet. So there are pitfalls like that that you really have to be aware of if you're gonna go that route. And it's not recommended unless you have, you know, a pretty decent understanding of cryptography and how Bitcoin transactions work and that sort of thing. That's a very, very power user way to go versus something like a hardware wallet with a good user experience. So yeah, this is the, the little project that I made. Again, I'm not saying this is necessarily the best way to go about it, but it was a really fun project that taught me a lot about uh, some of the Bitcoin cryptography and uh, you know the uh, secure uh, generation, secure storage practices. So it's, uh, it's quite a bit of fun. I've got it supporting uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Cash Adder, uh, Litecoin, Ethereum, and Digibyte now, so I can make my own, my own wallets for sort of my top five cryptocurrencies that I like to use. So what are some potential threats that we face in the cryptocurrency world? Again, I'm not a security expert, but these are coming from you know, research and, and understanding how these sort of systems work from a technical level. So uh, some things that have happened out here in the crypto space. Uh, one of them is with the central banking model and custodial wallet, which is an exchange goes under or steals your coins. Uh, that is not a fun one to experience if you trusted somebody else with your money. So MTGOX, Quadriga CX, these sorts of exchanges that just essentially fell off the face of the earth. And there's really nothing the end users of those services can do to get their coins back. So that stinks. Um, SIM swap attacks are a new one that are coming out. So um, hopefully many of you for your exchange accounts and that sort of thing are using two-factor authentication where you log in with you know, a username and password and then you get a uh, one-time use token sent to your mobile device to verify that it's you. Um, it turns out that using the one where you get a text message is actually vulnerable to some pretty serious attacks. And what these attackers will do is they'll do some social engineering. They'll call up AT&T or Verizon, whoever your phone provider is, and uh, get access to a new SIM for your phone. And then they'll steal your, your one-time access codes and get access to your accounts. Uh, so that's a thing that's happened where people have lost, lost a ton of money uh, dealing with exchanges. So a tip there is um, any exchange worth their salt is going to allow you to use an authenticator app 
uh, which is what you want to use. And that's a totally different system where you have a cryptographic seed stored on your phone. And um, it generates uh, the keys simultaneously based on time. So there's no actual exchange of information over the network. Your phone is simply generating uh, passcodes from a seed. And then uh, the service uses that same seed to go ahead and verify that that, that one-time code is correct. That's, that's a better way to do things. Uh, DNS hijacking or malware swaps address. Uh, this is another one where if, you know, it's maybe some malware gets on your computer and detects that you're using cryptocurrency wallets, um, it'll do a DNS swap and try to send you to a misleading website. Uh, so maybe you think you're going to Coinbase, but you're really logging in and accidentally uh, trying to deposit funds in the attacker's address. Um, I believe there have been cases that I've heard of where uh, if there's some malware on your computer and it detects that a crypto address is uh, copied to the clipboard, it will replace that copied address with the attacker's address. So you might go to uh, send money to a friend, they send you their address in an email, and really uh, you go to paste that into your wallet and it uh, is a swapped out address for the attacker. So I always like to really make it a point that uh, when I get an address, I double triple check before I send, because as we all know, uh, in cryptocurrency, transactions are not reversible. There's social engineering, and uh, this is just a broad general type of attack that happens, right? Somebody tries to convince you uh, with a fake account that they're uh, your favorite crypto personality and that you should send them money because they need help with something. Uh, you know, somebody tricks you into giving your uh, credentials to log into your exchange accounts uh, through like a fake email or something like that. There's a lot of different forms that this can take. And, and social engineering is a, is a very, very powerful tool from the perspective of the attacker. Uh, it's, it's surprisingly easy to trick even very, very smart and cautious people into doing things that they, they wouldn't normally do with a good social engineering attack. So they're, they're scary in that sense. And the final one that I think is kind of interesting and scary is the physical attack, AKA the old wrench attack. Um, Jameson Lopp in, in particular is a, is a prominent Bitcoin personality that has experienced this personally and has compiled uh, good resources on instances of this happening. And this is simply the type of attack where somebody knows you have a ton of Bitcoin because maybe you bragged about your holdings too much on Twitter and they find you physically and they try to extort money from you um, by you know, holding you hostage or physically threatening you or that sort of thing. So that's, a, that's very scary. Um, and you know, in general, I would recommend that you know, as somebody that's out here in the crypto space, uh, be enthusiastic about crypto, tell everybody you know that you love it, uh, but don't tell people that you're holding on to a bunch of it. Um, I don't tell people amounts ever because you know, even if you say, oh, well, I only have half a Bitcoin now, um, that half a Bitcoin might be worth uh, swinging your wrench at you at some point, which is rather scary. So you know, again, I recommend um, respecting your own privacy and not giving too many details about the, the sort of crypto holdings that you have. So what should I use? Josh, what do you recommend? What's the chain to approved wallet, this, that, and the other? Well, um, I don't have any of those specific recommendations because I strongly believe you need to figure out what works best for you based on uh, this kind of information. So factors to consider when recommending a wallet or service to, uh, for yourself or for somebody else in your life that wants to get into crypto. Consider the level of tech savviness uh, that this person has. Uh, consider the use cases. What are you actually using it for? Are you trying to trade? Are you uh, trying to have some long-term savings? Do you just want to experiment with it and do some day-to-day -day spending? Those are all things to take into consideration, as well as the actual amounts that you're going to be storing in that wallet. Um, a wallet that is appropriate for $50 worth of Bitcoin may not be appropriate for $500,000 worth of Bitcoin. So custodial wallets, I think, are great for small amounts. They're obviously great for purchasing and selling. It's a generally a pretty easy on-ramp for a lot of people, especially in the U.S. Um, even with the annoying KYC and AML requirements, you know, if you're okay with um, giving a little bit of information about yourself to a service you trust, it's a pretty easy way to get your hand on cryptocurrencies. 
and exchange them. And I think they are good for uh, non-tech savvy individuals. Um, you know, letting somebody else handle your security is sometimes a good thing, uh, depending on your level of knowledge. Online wallets, uh, like your Bitcoin full node or your uh, multi-asset wallet on your mobile phone. Great for day-to-day -day purchases. So if you like to tip and spend cryptocurrencies uh, and you want to just have some available and ready to go, uh, so small to medium amounts, uh, reasonably tech savvy. You need to understand the implications of backing up your seed phrase and restoring a wallet and that sort of thing uh, when you're using a non-custodial online wallet. And finally, offline wallets. So this is for large amounts, for sure. Long-term savings, because uh, you, you often don't have immediate access to it, especially if you're doing something like generating your own key pairs versus using a hardware wallet. Uh, so it's usually better for funds that are left untouched for a while, I think. Um, definitely better for more tech savvy individuals. You need to understand the security implications of whatever wallet that you're using. Uh, but hardware wallets do help to bridge this gap uh, because the user experience is an important part of the design of these products. So some final thoughts for me uh, before we get to questions. And I you know, want to thank everybody for your attention and, and listening to uh, kind of the presentation part. Uh, I think Q&A will be a, a ton of fun. So uh, remember that private keys are the core of our security focus. What a crypto wallet fundamentally is, is a collection of cryptographic private keys. And if they're not your keys, that means it's not your Bitcoin. It's important to understand that whoever controls the private keys ultimately has control over the funds. And before you Bitcoin, know your level of technical knowledge, your threat model and usage patterns, amounts, spending versus saving, etc. And understand these core concepts and ask for help if you need it. In general, when I talk to audiences about cryptocurrencies, I'm not there to tell them what I think is the most exciting things about crypto as a computer scientist, as a software engineer, and as an all around gigantic nerd. Uh, I want you to understand how this technology can apply to your life and your use cases. So, you know, not everybody wants to dig into the technical nitty gritty of wallet security, of how transactions work and that sort of thing, or proof of work mining. But I always recommend, you know, just understand enough that you can keep yourself safe, that you, uh, you know what's going on, and you can be empowered to use this technology in a way that helps you. So again, understand what you need to know, what interests you, and don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. There are tons of great experts out there, uh, and there are tons of people out there uh, that love to teach and explain, like myself, that uh, you know you can use as a resource, uh, and meetup groups fall under that as well. So I didn't want to go on too too long with the the presentation part, but I hope it was informative. And so now uh, I, I want to open it up to questions. Uh, anything that anybody wants to know. And again, as a reminder, um, you know I was recording this. If people are more comfortable, I can simply just uh, upload the presentation parts. Uh, but I'd love to have some of the Q&A in there as well, if you all are okay with that. All right, Josh. Well, thanks for presenting the group. We'll give you a round of applause here first. Woohoo! Hey, yes, round of applause. So, uh, uh, Jabron, if you can put my pretty face up uh, so everybody can remember how handsome I am, uh, that would be great because I, I, I kind of have the uh, first question. Um, I, have the, I have the first question for you here. Uh, oh, God. Josh. Oh. <laughs> So, so the the first question that I have is, um, assuming somebody wants uh, a wallet where they can have is easy access to getting the cash out of the wallet as quickly as possible. Like, what sort of, um, like like for example, I, I have money in uh, cash account and I have a, a debit card attached to my cash account. If I wanted something like that, which wallet would you recommend where I wanted as much liquidity to take money out through my a debit or a credit card? So are you talking about actually using like a debit card that's linked to a service? Yes. 
That I I don't know. Um, I've never used the like the crypto debit cards because I always buy crypto to use it as crypto. Like I kind of go go the other direction. Um, so generally speaking, in terms of liquidity for spending crypto, I'm a big fan of the mobile wallet. I, I generally like like to keep spend amounts in like Bitcoin.com or Coinomi. Um, with one that is actually linked to a card, I don't know. I think Coinbase has one but I'm not 100% sure on that. Yeah, it's only for Europe, but uh, as far as I know. But um, we also have some questions in the chat that have come in. Uh, oh, great. If it's cool, I'll just, I'll feed you the questions and uh, we'll go from there. Someone asks, how about sending BTC to a, a BCH address? Okay, so that, that can happen too. Um, and there's luckily less pitfalls with that. So just to give a general idea of the problem, um, I, I think a lot of you have been in the space at least for a while. So, um, so Bitcoin Cash is a fork of Bitcoin BTC that occurred in 2017. So it's just kind of a different uh, worldview of, of what Bitcoin should be and what it should be used for. Um, I use them both. You know, I, I like Bitcoin Cash, full disclaimer. I hope I don't upset anyone uh, with that fact. But um, they both, because they both share a software history and a blockchain history, they share a legacy address format. So the normal Bitcoin addresses that you see that start with a one, um, and you know they're like uh, upper and lowercase characters, that's base 58 encoded addresses. And so it's entirely possible if you are going to send Bitcoin and you're looking at uh, a wallet that supports multiple assets on the other end, you could copy and paste a uh, BCH address that's in that same format. Now, what actually happens in that case is you didn't like really do a cross-chain transaction. You simply sent your Bitcoin to another Bitcoin address, but that Bitcoin address came from a Bitcoin Cash wallet. And so what you have to do to recover is you have to use the seed phrase for that wallet that received it in error and uh, you have to go and find the private key for that, that matching address. And then you usually have to just import it into another wallet that will actually recognize that transaction on the blockchain and uh, send it to the right BTC receiving address. So I'll give you, if that's maybe a little confusing, a practical example of this, I actually just went uh, through with an older gentleman that contacted me uh, online. This gentleman uh, wanted to send um, Bitcoin cash from an exchange to his hardware wallet. He's, he was using a ledger. Ledger only supports the legacy address format, the base 58 encoded format for Bitcoin cash. It doesn't support the new um, cash out of format. Um, the exchange, however, for Bitcoin cash uh, only allows sending to Bitcoin cash cash out of addresses. So the mistake that happened was he copied a Bitcoin Cash wallet address that was a legacy address into Gemini and sent his Bitcoin BTC to the ledger. So that wallet was in, that those funds were locked up in an address that was controlled by the ledger seed phrase, but he couldn't see it because the ledger was only generating addresses in the newer Bitcoin format using uh, Betch 32 SegWit addresses. So what we had to do then is we just had to go in, we had to use like a mnemonic tool to uh, and, and figure out the right derivation path to get the private key for that address that he sent to, load it in another wallet that recognized those funds and send it back to the right address. Um, so it's kind of a process, uh, but it can happen either way cross chain. Um, what might be useful for people to know is, you know, because this has obviously been a problem for the last couple of years, both coins have moved to newer address formats that um, eliminate this confusion. So generally speaking now, if you're using Bitcoin Cash, you're gonna see a, a, um, an address in cash adder format. It's a base 32 type format, uh, so you'll only see lowercase letters. Um, and Bitcoin, a lot of wallets now use Betch 32. It's a similar base 32 format for only SegWit addresses. Uh, so that helps with the confusion some, but it's just, it's an unfortunate um, reality of those coins sharing a history, uh, sharing a software history and sharing a history on the blockchain that makes things a little bit confusing for people. Uh, but anyway, I hope that answers the question. I want to be detailed, but also not 
go off on a tangent too much. Yep. Um, there's a question from Graham saying, can Handshake fix this? I think he was referring to um, security and... Um, are you, are you yeah, familiar? I was talking about the DNS, the DNS swap attack. Is that something that Handshake can address if you're familiar? Um, I'm actually not familiar with Handshake, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. If you could explain a little bit about what it, what it is, I might be able to understand it a little better. Yeah, so Handshake is a blockchain that replaces the root DNS. So um, instead of having domain name certificate authorities, you actually just have a blockchain that is the certificate authority. Um, and so you can use your own, you can point your computer to, to reference a DNS resolver that recognizes the Handshake blockchain. So I'll send you, it's just handshake.org. Um, it only launched like a month ago, but um, it's already resolving domains. A lot of people that were behind the original, a lot of the original Bitcoin core team are now working on it. So it's a legit project. That's excellent. And yeah, I, I think in that case, you know, if you're um, kind of doing that power user thing and, and pointing, pointing your PC specifically to a DNS that you trust, uh, that is helpful for avoiding that kind of attack. And as well, if it's blockchain based, I'm sure that there's some underlying cryptography that helps. Um, again, I don't know enough about that to speak super in depth on sure. it, but it sounds like it, it might might potentially help with that problem. Cool. Yeah. Uh, handshake is really cool. I'm glad you brought that up, Graham. Um, it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, if, yes. There's another Thanks, question Graham. from D. Good. Uh, is there an interest earning platform that allows for coin security? So one of the problems with the interest bearing account type thing is that in every case that I have seen personally, um, and I've looked at a couple different ones, they're all custodial services. So the, you essentially have the trade off of, I'm going to put my crypto in the trust of somebody else. And the trade off for that is I'm going to earn some extra money off of it. I'm going to earn interest. I'll say me personally, like my savings sort of crypto, I would rather just control it myself. I'm a, I'm a big believer in the fundamental, you know, if, if you understand it, you should hold your own private keys. Uh, I, I don't know that there is any platform that allows that um, simply because part of a lending platform like that is their ability to pay you interest back as a consumer with an account comes from the fact that they can lend out that cryptocurrency to someone else at a higher interest rate. I mean, that's sort of how the model fundamentally works, right? So if you had one of these services where you just gave them an address um, for them to deposit interest in, but they didn't have access to loan your crypto out, I, I don't know that that would, that would work well. Um, you know, the other option out there is I've seen, you know, like these peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms where you send, you know, you actually are sort of using them as an intermediary to directly give somebody else a loan and then they pay you back. Uh, but again, that comes, that comes with, you just have to give up all your money up front. So yeah, I, I don't know that there's a platform that allows secure uh, ownership of your own private keys, but also allows deposit. I don't, I don't think it works well with that model. Would that be technically possible, though? Um, I would imagine that there's probably a way to do it. Like, there might have to be some agreement where you have to be a little bit more of an active participant in it, where, like, you have your own wallet, and then you agree to upfront them some amount of money, say, every month, and then you get your interest payment back. Like that, that could be a potential model. So like you have to manually send them money to pool together to do their lending services and then they send you interest back. Um, but I, I, you know, off the top of my head, uh, I'm not thinking of a like super cryptographically secure way to do that. I, what, about someone, through, what about through a contract? Yeah, through a smart contract, it might be entirely possible. Yeah. I, that's, that's an interesting thing that, uh, Maybe somebody that knows a little bit more about that than me can speak on, but uh, great question. There's, um, there's, there's, there's three questions that I'm going to group into sort of one and a half question. Um, so the first is from Robert. Uh, can you move Bitcoin from Coinbase to Ledger? And then there's a second from, uh, I hope I'm saying this correctly, 
Delgreda, Delgreda, uh, where do you acquire a wallet and how has BTC moved from one kind of wallet to another kind? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, can you move funds from Coinbase to a ledger? Absolutely. Um, Coinbase allows you to withdraw up to certain amounts uh, based on their policies to an external wallet. So um, I'll say personally, I actually use Coinbase to do my crypto purchases. Um, I have to use like Shapeshift and some other services for coins that they don't offer. But you know, I, I like Coinbase. And uh, what they allow you to do is once you know the funds clear that you use to actually purchase the coins with, then you're allowed to create a transaction and send to uh, an external wallet. So to answer the question of, well, how do I acquire a wallet and how are funds actually moved? So all a wallet is, is actually, it's just a piece of software that essentially speaks the Bitcoin protocol. Um, what, what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies really are is they're like a network protocol for money. So uh, Bitcoin defines a set of rules for how you're allowed to send money between people and it's on this peer-to-peer -peer global network. So there's tons of wallets out there. It's really just software that you download. So you can go, uh, you can go get a mobile wallet. Um, I use Bitcoin.com and Coinomi on mobile. Um, those allow Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash on the first one, and then Coinomi allows like thousands of different coins. And those are both wallets where you get your own seed phrase, so you actually control your private keys. Um, you could also go out and purchase a physical hardware wallet, which does that same thing. It, it generates your keys for you and allows you to do transactions. So the final part of your question was, well, how, do, how does money actually get transferred around? Well, what really happens is, what is called a Bitcoin transaction. Um, these are totally peer-to-peer -to -peer transactions that happen on, on these cryptocurrency networks versus something like a debit card. So if you go to make a purchase with your debit card, what actually happens is the payment processor Visa goes out and talks to your bank account and verifies that you have X amount of dollars in your bank account. And then it goes back to the, uh, the merchant's bank account and deposits those funds. So it does a, a transfer through an intermediary. And that intermediary is Visa, that intermediary is PayPal or Cash App or what have you. Uh, with Bitcoin, this is actually a totally peer-to-peer -to -peer transaction process. So what you do is you use your wallet, you have some Bitcoin in your wallet, and your wallet uses the private key to create a digital signature for a transaction. So you say, I want to send X amount of Bitcoin to this address. Your wallet creates a transaction. It, it, uh, it creates a digital signature that proves you own the money that's in your wallet on the, that's you know, out on the blockchain. And then it broadcasts that transaction out to the network. And that transaction has to be included in a block uh, that miners are working on. And that, tells the rest of the, the network then essentially that uh, this transaction followed all the rules, it was valid, um, it's part of the blockchain history, and now the person on the other end has received your Bitcoin. So that's, that's kind of a high level overview of how transactions work. Uh, you know, in, in a simpler terms is you have a piece of software, if you have uh, Bitcoin in your Coinbase account, you can withdraw that to your wallet. And what Coinbase does is they create a transaction on the Bitcoin network that sends it to your wallet. Now you own those funds at that address. Hey, Josh, I have a quick question. Um, we discussed this a little bit on LinkedIn, uh, you and I. Um, do you have any word or any comment in regards to, you know, if I put my private key on my treasure and then all of a sudden I try to load it on my ledger and all of a sudden I can't see my keys. Do you have a, is that go back to that naming convention that we discussed or what kind of, do you have any comments on that? Oh, so, so you're saying I, I have a seed phrase from a, uh, a ledger or a keep key or something. Correct. And I go, I go to restore that wallet on another uh -huh. hardware wallet and I'm not seeing my funds. Correct. That's what you're saying. Correct. Yep. Um, that, yeah, that all comes down to those derivation paths and derivation schemes, um, defined in, in bit 32 and bit 44. Um, so different wallets use different schemes by default. So I've run into that. Like if you, uh, like Coinomi uses a different, uh, 
uses a different derivation path than Bitcoin.com. So if I wanted to load some uh, tip addresses into my other mobile wallet, when I go to restore that private key, I have to explicitly tell Coinomi what derivation path that the other wallet was using. So you know, I don't know if that's a, a feature that your other hardware wallet allows. Um, so it can be kind of a pain. Uh, so generally, if you're lucky, the new wallet that you're restoring the wallet to will allow you to say, hey, what derivation path do I want to use? That, that helps it find your funds then. Uh, so like you look at your old wallet and see what scheme it was using. Uh, that information is not always easy to find. Like it was, it was pretty easy to find in my one mobile wallet, but I, like for the hardware wallets, I, uh, when I was trying to help out this gentleman, for example, I had to look up, I had to Google, like, what's the default derivation path for Bitcoin Cash on a ledger? Um, if you're having a lot of trouble, there's a tool called, yeah, it's uh, Ian Coleman's BIP39 tool. You can download it offline. It's an open source and pretty well audited tool that you can download and, and run completely offline. But you can plug in your seed phrase and you can play with all those parameters and it'll, it'll show the generated addresses and private keys for you. So you might be able to like rescue your funds with a wallet that recognizes that path and um, then send those funds off to the new wallet. So hopefully that answers your, your question. Yeah, thanks. Um, if you have, like, if you have, um, you're trying to do it in, in inter-transfer and you still have access to all the funds on the old wallet, like you have access to the funds on the ledger, you want to move to a keep key and then restore it and work. Um, what I would do is if you want to still use the same seed phrase, you can initialize the new wallet with that, but you're going to want to tr actually transfer all those funds to the new addresses, like initiating an actual blockchain transfer. Because really what the fundamental problem is, uh, without like going on and on about this, is um, the new wallet, it's, it still has the same cryptographic seeds. So like fundamentally, you still own the coins. But because it's generating addresses through a different path, the wallet doesn't recognize what the balances of what you own on the blockchain. So like really your money is still there, but you can't see it or spend it because the wallet doesn't recognize it. So that's that's where all that confusion comes from with those different derivation schemes. Yeah, I was using, so I've tried out the key key, I've tried out the ledger, I've tried out the treasure. Um, and I've noticed that this naming scheme was different between the treasure and basically everything else. Um, but the, the nano, uh, le the ledgers and the key key both use the same naming convention. So those seem to work together. And the reason I do that is basically so that way, if I have one device failure, then I have something to back up to. Um, let's say there's an update or something goes down. I like to have multiple devices. Right? Yeah, Confirm and I want to I want to just hammer home that point too for everyone here, because um, you know as I've experimented with a bunch of you know different wallets, like different mobile wallets, desktop wallets, because I'm obviously learning and trying to find you know learn different bits of the tech and, and find out which ones work and have a have the experience that I want. Um, I've had that where I've like taken a seed phrase and, and deleted an old wallet and then tried to put that new seed, seed phrase in the new wallet and the money's not there. And you know, you kind of freak out. If you still have the seed phrase, you still have your money. It's still there. So like, don't panic, but it's just going to take some legwork to figure out um, how to actually make those funds visible again in the new wallet based on the, the derivation scheme. So like as long as you still have the seed phrase and you don't like light the seed phrase on fire and forget it, your money's still there. You're just gonna have to do some work to see it. All right. Um, I think there's a couple links in the chat that David has put um, for those hardware wallets. Um, thank you, Josh, so much for coming online and doing this presentation for us. Um, are you streaming somewhere on, on Twitch or something? No, uh, I'm not streaming anywhere. I have a YouTube channel. Um, it's uh, just chain to UTS and the main website is chain to UTS.com. It's a uh, chain toots. So I Can you post put that on the description or the chat. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I regularly uh, create just informational tutorials. So like, for example, uh, you know, like they're all about 10 minute videos. Um, why can't you brute force a Bitcoin private key? Um, what are some HD wallet terms you should understand? Um, you know, Bitcoin recovery, that kind of thing. I, I talk about technical stuff um, and try to make it accessible to broad audiences. Like I don't consider myself to be an investor or a trader. That's not what I'm interested in. Uh, so I'm really just talking about, hey, here's how this tech works and what you can use it for. Um, so yeah, I would appreciate if everyone would, you know, go on, subscribe, share, um, and leave feedback on tutorials. I'm always looking to figure out how I can uh, better, you know, teach teach my audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, thank thank you all so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, thank you. It's, it's to ts.com. Yeah, it's in the it's in the chat. Uh, it's yeah, in the I'm chat. Gonna, I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. Where's the you Where's the YouTube channel? So um, it is. There's actually a link directly to it um, on uh, the Chain Toots website. Okay. I I don't have enough popularity yet to have my own custom YouTube URL. Yes. Like, you have to have so many subscribers to do, be able to do like youtube.com slash chain I don't have that yet. I'm not cool enough for that yet. So uh, you, can, you can find that on my website or if you search for chain toots on YouTube. Uh, you so, so everybody should go subscribe and then hit like on his videos to help this guy out. <laughs> yeah, that would rock. <laughs>